Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Welcome back. I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday evening on this Daylight Savings Time. I hope you got enough sleep. We all lost an hour, but we got it back on the other end. And today's episode is part two of From Tragedy to Triumph. I know you all enjoyed the episode with John Boy Watts from last week. It was a roller coaster. It was absolutely exciting. And we're going to be talking about part two of it so that you can be able to get even more and we can learn some more in-depth information about Mr. John Boy Watts himself. The Sherrod Show, again, is brought to you by iHeartRadio. This very episode, as well as part one, will be on iHeartRadio. It's currently airing on Essence Television. Look right on your monitor. You can see this interview right um, last week's interview on Essence Television. The things we talked about, the stories, this was just the tip of the iceberg because we're going to begin again, um, picking up where we left off from last week. John Boy, how are you this evening? Uh, fine, fine. How was your birthday? It was great. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself on a birthday. Um, now, audience members, we will be taking your questions and your comments um, at about the halfway mark during the show. So be patient. Just enjoy what we're speaking about. Now, ladies and gentlemen, last week we left off um, where John Boy just got arrested and he served. He got sentenced, actually, and he was sentenced and convicted to six years in, is it federal or state prison, John? State state prison and along with Gene. And he did something very noble where um, Gene was only going to get, um, Gene was actually going to get 12 years and John Boy is only going to get a year, but he decided to split the difference and they each do six apiece. What a friend, ladies and gentlemen. And that's where we're going to be picking off. You all set to go, John Boy? Yes, sir. So John Boy, tell me a little bit about what it was like the first day that you got on that bus headed to be uh, serving time. At the certain time I got on that bus, uh, it was like, it was like, I mean, it, 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 you know how they say I'm free as a bird? Mm -hmm. You know, people say that. Well, I felt like I was like free as a bird, you know, being my first time being in uh, prison, ever been arrested before, uh, serving 33 months before I were released. Uh, I just feel free. I mean, I uh, thank God that I made it because I witnessed a lot of people in prison. Uh, uh, you know, they didn't make it. You know, there was a lot of fights and riots. Now, so let me back it up, John Boy, because um, I, I may have phrased the question wrong. Now, we're going to get to the part you just mentioned when you got out. But my question initially is, what did it feel like the first day you were getting on that bus to go and serve your time? Oh, OK. Uh, it, it was actually, uh, it was a sad day for me because I knew that I was going away to serve time, but I'm also leaving my family behind. Uh, I just had a, a daughter, I think she was like three years old, um, her mom, uh, my brother, I think Patrick was like, 18 years old, and my mom was actually living with me. So I was taking care of all of them at my home. They were living with me. So when I left, uh, it was a sad day. But yeah. I knew that I, I would get over it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you, you and Jean served at the same place, same facility, correct? Yes. And you were, were you all cellmates at the time? No. Mm -hmm. Now, what was Gene's mindset when he was going in? Was he losing it or was he um, able to just make the stone face adjustment like you were? Uh, he was nervous. I think being him being 11 years older than myself, uh, he was more uh, nervous than me. Um, you know, I grew up in the hood. You know, I seen fights and people get killed and stuff. Uh, he didn't see stuff like that, so I think it was a little bit harder for him, but he adjusted, adjusted just like myself. We made the adjustments, and, uh, and we got through it. Now, John Boy, um, what did you do to occupy your time? You were just mentioning you served 33 months, so what were you able to do to occupy your time, and what was your mindset in there? Uh, I lifted a lot of weights, and I... Uh, I started to uh, 
go back to my passion I had when I was like 10, I start to uh, pick up a pencil and a pad and start drawing again. I used to love to draw. So I, I uh, drew a lot of pictures and sent them out to my, uh, my mom. Uh, you know, so that kind of kept me busy. And uh, when I wasn't uh, drawing, I was working out. And when I wasn't working out, I was in the library, you know, writing my book. Now, now, John, boy, after the time was up and you served your time, um, you got out. And what was the world like 33 months later? Did it really feel like a lot changed or did it feel like it was still the same um, when you got out? Well, I went to jail uh, 88. I came home in 92. So it wasn't that much have changed. There was still no computers and cell phones and you know people still were using the pay phone and pagers and uh so a lot of it had not changed when I came home in 92. And I was smack there right in the right in the Rodney King. That was right smack there when you yes. came home. It was a lot going on um back in 92 actually and then you know you had the riots as well and then you also the music was quite different because now west coast was really representing with the rap game with the r&b it was an extraordinary time when it came to music so what was your first move um after you got out when i first got out the first thing i did i uh contacted one of my attorneys because when I was in jail, recall that my uh, Rose Royce, uh, my girlfriend, she got jacked in my Rose Royce. And the insurance company decided not to pay. So the first thing I did was contact my attorney, met with him to strategize how I can get reimbursed for my loss. And they kept trying to fight it. So I decided to go to trial and I, I ended up winning. I mean, it took us maybe, I went to trial for almost two months and I got a verdict and I, uh, they settled the, the case. And uh, from that day I was, I took off. Now, the interesting thing about it is that um, it's, it's documented, well documented in your book that you told your girlfriend at the time not to drive the car, Correct. but she drove it and got carjacked with one of her girlfriends in the car. Is that correct? Correct. Now, um, after you after you uh, you got settled on it um, and got your funds for it after a long battle, um, my question though first, uh, John, but what was the year making model? What version of the Rolls Royce was that that you had? Uh, with the '88 uh, Rolls Royce Corniche. So you uh, bought it brand new. Yes. Okay. And think about this. This is a man at the time you were what, 26 years old driving a Rolls Royce, huh? Yes. Now, um, John Boy, also well documented in your book is when you got out, um, you were under the impression that you had 60,000 put away that you put away. That was going to be something that was going to get you jumpstart you back um, into the game of life. But what happened when you found out or what, what was the reason or what happened that that um, when you found out you didn't have it and what led to you um, not having that money? Well, uh... I think one of the mistakes that I made, but you don't know if it was a mistake until later, is leaving the money uh, with someone that had no experience in saving money, investing money, didn't know the true value of money. And that was my baby mother. I mean, um, what does she know? You know, I'm 26, I think she was 20. Oh, wow. Wow. That young. Oh, yeah. So she, uh, you know, she went through the money and I couldn't get mad, you know, uh, but I knew I had the capability of making money again. Now, you know, John Boy, um, 60000 in 1992 was almost like having 121000 120000 um, in today's day. It was a lot of money back then. Is that correct? Yes. And then to have that. Now, interestingly enough, um, your life is like a movie, John Boy, because um, something happened that caused you to go into the medical business. What happened? Uh, well, after I received uh, my settlement, uh, I was at this uh, nightclub one night 
and not knowing what I really wanted to do, I was thinking about investing my money into real estate. And I uh, met this young lady. She was sitting by herself. Well, she had a group of friends, but she was sitting alone. So I walked over to her. I said, I'd like to dance? She said, no. I said, whose birthday is it? She said, mine. She was so smart. I said, you should be happy. Why are you so upset? So I sat next to her. I didn't ask you to sit next to her. So I sat down anyway. And she was a few years older than me. So I said, uh, well, we got to talk and I introduced myself. Then she kind of loosened up a little bit. So she asked, what do I do? I said, well, nothing right now. I think I'm going to get a real estate. I said, what do you do? So she said she was a director of nurses of this uh, home health care agency owned by three young white boys that live in New York. She said, we need to open up a Black agency because there are no Black home health care agencies in California. I said, they make a lot of money. She said, yeah. So we exchanged numbers. And one day she said, come up to my job after work, like around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, when, the, when everyone was gone. So she showed me some checks, half a million, 300,000, 500,000, 800,000 a week. And she said, I haven't seen any white guys in a couple of years. And they get all, they're making all this money. I said, well, can he teach me? She said, do you want to go in the healthcare business? I said, yes. So she taught me how to uh, start my own healthcare agency. And then when I, as, just as I was putting it together, the Rodney King riot broke out. So that made it even better for me because now all the white nurses and the Filipino nurses that were going into the neighborhoods to take care of African-American people, they were afraid after the riot. So I hired all black nurses and send them over to the hood because they wasn't afraid. And that's how I, I did so good. Now, now, according to your book, you saw something very interesting where right during the riots, there was a nurse who got knocked in the head trying to see her patient. Correct. Um, and she was trying to save her patient's life because nobody would come to save that to uh, see about that patient but her. And you and Jean came and saved her. Is that correct? Correct. Now, that was another inspiration to let you know that you really need to put uh, medical to that field. Yes. Wow. Now, um, I've never known that that was on your list of things to want to do, but it's amazing how you fell into something that really inspired you. And so when it, once it got to running, um, John Boy, did it become an immediate success? Yes. Well, the first, the first couple of months, it was hard uh, because you know, the whites and the uh, Filipinos had that market sold up. So I started off, I think, by six patients. And uh, it was okay. It was enough to cover the bills. And I think I had maybe two or three nurses. So I found out later that the nursing uh, facilities and home health care agencies they were paying their doctors $75 a patient. So I decided to take some money out the bank and go and meet with a couple of African-American doctors. And I offered to pay them $150 a patient. And I agreed to pay all the copay for the elderly because a lot of them had copays for their medication. And I knew they were gonna fix the income. So if I figure if I pay their copay, and double the payment for the doctor's referral, you know, I would enhance my business. And a month later, I had 460 patients doing over a million a month. For a man who really didn't know much about the medical field, that was a brilliant move to be able to triple how many patients you had by just doing those two things. That's quite amazing. That's quite yeah, amazing. Well, I'm, more, I'm more than triple because I started with six patients and over 400. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yes. my so, but it's okay. But but uh, business is business. It doesn't matter what type of business. Business is still business. <laughs> well, so so John Boy, um, changes, but business is business. So, John Boy, that's when, when you um, ascertained the 400 patients, that's when the money started rolling in? Yes. Now, um, what was your what was your title, and what were you doing um, while everybody else was running everything? Well, I was the administrator, you know, close to CEO, because I started the company, 
And uh, and I hired other people to run the business for me. Uh, so it was at a point where I only went into the office on Mondays, I mean, on Fridays to sign checks. I didn't have to go in the other days. It, it was it was self, self-sufficient. So how was your golf swing back then? Okay, no, I'm joking. No golf. <laughs> <laughs> no golf. Now, John Boy, um, so the interesting thing about it is that in your book, you became so successful, you made more money in the medical field than you ever did in the drug game. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. And you went from having um, Bentleys and Rolls Royces and living um, in a beautiful mansion back then um, as a drug dealer to having a house built, listen, ladies and gentlemen, in Bel Air Estates, not in just Bel Air, but Bel Air Estates. Now at this time, how old were you? I was 33. Okay, 33 years old. Um, and he had a house built. And, and then look, look at your monitor, ladies and gentlemen. There's a picture of the house before it was built. And then there's a picture of the house after it's built. And that car that's in front, that actually is his convertible Bentley. Is that correct? Yeah, my words were the second yeah. one. Remember the first one I purchased the 88. And yes. I bought another one in 93. Now, we'll tell you the story about the Rolls Royce that he bought um, brand new in 92. Now, that was the one where you were riding um, in Sherman Oaks with Gene. And you passed the dealership and made a U-turn and bought it. Is that what it is? Yes. And paid cash for it, correct? Yes. Okay, now tell me what that lifestyle was like the second time around. It was much different. The first time, uh, selling drugs, uh, you always lived in fear. You were afraid that the police gonna butt you, or you're gonna get jacked, robbed, killed, kidnapped. So I always lived in fear, you know, and, and that's what, you know, I mean, it, it, co it comes along with uh, that territory. You know what I'm saying? When, when you're in a business that you're doing illegal acts uh, and hurting people, uh, you know, things happen. So I went from an illegal act to selling drugs, making a contribution to hurt my community unconsciously to later to legal business and helping all of those same people, people, mothers and grandmothers in, in my community. And it was much more rewarding. But the lifestyle the second time was much better because I didn't have to ride around with a gun. I didn't have to worry about the police breaking in my door, uh, someone robbing me. Uh, it was just so much, I, I felt free uh, the second Next. time. Now, you know, the interesting thing, John Boy, is that um, when you had your property, the beautiful home um, built in Bel Air Estates, um, once it was done, you didn't have any furniture. Is that correct? Correct. So you um, enjoyed the place, but then you went out and you bought furniture at one of the largest furniture places in L.A. And yeah. you took Gene along with you. And a guy basically insulted you when you put your order in and how many, what did you need and all that? It was about $67,000 worth of furniture initially, but yes. it eventually came out to about 100,000. Correct. Now, um, what was it like um, being a young gunslinger, being able to buy that much furniture and walk into a furniture store? Um, you know, because as a kid, when you go into furniture stores, when I'm parents, everything seems so unaffordable. But how yes. was it to be able to buy the most expensive china and end tables, love seats, et cetera, back then? Uh, it's, um, I realize I, I came a long way. I mean, to not being able to afford anything, to be able to walk into a place and afford anything you want and not just say, I want six chairs. I can say, I want a dozen or I want that sofa, but I don't like the fabric. Can I change it to silk? Oh, silk going to cost you another 20000 and we have to order it for Italy. It's going to take you four months. And then, all right, order it. So, I mean, just to be able to do that, it's something that I wish everyone can experience, especially those that come from a poor uh, area or, or raised poor, broken. It's a great experience. 
Now, John Boy, um, as time went on, you were mentioning in your book that people started getting jealous, um, such as the IRS. The IRS started snooping around. Um, even in the midst, you were planning on throwing a humongous party at your beautiful uh, Bel Air place. And you had all of the celebrities. And ladies and gentlemen, look at your monitor. You'll be able to see some of the people you see there, Tommy Ford. You see there with Clifton Powell. Uh, so many big, big names were coming um, to your party, but something happened where you got a message from Gene that they were trying to get into one of your um, lockers where you had storage, is that correct? Correct. And But according to your book, as I was reading it, it didn't really seem like it bothered you. You were just saying, okay, we're, we're, everything is legit on our end, and you went back to party. Yes. Now, now, why weren't you worried about the IRS trying to knock you? on your door? Because I had no idea. First of all, I knew I didn't do anything wrong. I, I had a legitimate business. But later when I got indicted in 1994, they served me with an indictment at my home in Bel Air. Uh, I realized in the indictment, it said overbilling. And when I started talking to Gene, uh, he, that's when he shared with me that the lady I had worked for me uh, and her husband from Nigeria was uh, overbilling. Oh. That, yeah, they oh. were overbilling. And that Gene was a part of the overbilling. They were doing it on Sundays when I was in there. Wow. Yeah. Now, 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 a couple of things. I mean, we can ask your questions, ladies and gentlemen. We'll get to your questions shortly um, for this gentleman and scholar, Mr. John Boy Watch. We appreciate him again. Um, being on the part two episode of, on the Sherrard show. Now, John Boy, um, what does it mean to overbill um, when you're in the industry that you're in? And second question is, do, don't you get a warning before the bottom completely falls out? Uh, answer your question, the second one, no. It, it just hit you. The first one, to overbill, let's say for example, um, I had a patient that needed to be seen uh, three times a week. And to overbill, you may do your nursing notes and say you visit that patient six times a week. So Medicare, they would pay you for six times a week versus three times a week. And that's what they call overbilling. But the problem with Medicare is that they didn't inform you that you overbill or there was a problem until a year later. They do an annual report, which is stupid to me because a person can overbill every week, you know, for, you know, 52 weeks. So, so why would you allow someone to have the opportunity to overbill and, and, and then you request that they turn everything in at the end of the year. Uh, so, so that's what happened. So when they realized they were overbilling, they asked me for all the records. I sent them all the records. Again, I'm still wasn't aware that there was anything wrong. And then later they came out and showed me the problem and what happened and it's okay. Do they give you time to fix it? Uh, yes, but at this, at one time they asked me, they said I owed 300 some thousand and I gave them, I wrote them a check for 300 some thousand. And then the second eight months, they said I owed like um, 2 million or something. And then they were going to hold my reimbursement so I couldn't pay my nurses. So if I can't pay the nurses, then I can't see, they can't see the patients. And you're not going to give me any money. So I just turn in my provider number and say, I'm out of the business. So now, John Boy, uh, Gene, to this, up until this point, was very, very loyal to you. And yeah. he, was, he was your right-hand man. And it was likened to David and Jonathan. Jonathan loved David unconditionally, even though he was the king's son. And David was going to uproot his king his dad, which is Saul. But why was Gene, he, Gene told you everything typically, but why was he going behind your back over billing people knowing 
that the possibility of him going to prison or getting busted for this was um, evident? Well, I think that most people, when they commit a crime, I don't think they think about jail. They, they, they can't think about going to jail and, and commit the crime too, because then they're going to get afraid and not commit the crime. You just think about the crime, the act, the overbilling, the selling drugs, whatever it is, that's it. Now, this is the deal I had with Gene. I said, I paid Gene uh, $2,500 a every Friday to be my uh, manager. And I told him I would give him 10% on every dollar over a certain amount of dollar each month. So if I made $300,000, I just paid him $2,500 and no bonus. If I made $310,000, he would get 10% of the 10,000. So if he bill or help bill or extra 500,000 that's sitting in the bank, then he, he gets 50,000. This is an extraordinary amount of money even back then, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to uh, John Boy Watts. I do see your questions. What we're gonna do is take a quick break and then we're going to come back. We'll take your questions and get more of the story about Mr. John Boy Watts on our special Sunday conversation of From Triumph, From Tragedy to Triumph, Part 2. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Here we are on the Sherrard Show, the Manhattans. Welcome, gentlemen. She is on the number one show on television. Nine one one. Thank you. That's so lovely. That just made my day. I get 72 masks. I wear masks all the time. Sometimes I wear a mask in bed, me and my woman. She don't know who she in bed with. I wash my hands. <laughs> just wasn't in it for myself. I was in it for the sound and for the project to be successful. But, oh, know. man, we, we, we didn't mess around here and made it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Tune in to Essence Television as well as iHeartRadio. In the meantime, have a wonderful evening. See you tomorrow. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard, having a wonderful conversation this Sunday with Mr. John Boy Watts. Um, about his life. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the book. Get a good look at this book. This is the absolute greatest read I've ever had in my life. And what you see on the pictures is exactly what he went through. And not only this book is such a great read because we found out last week that he wrote the film script before he wrote the book. So when you read this, you are on the edge of your seat. Uh, eat your heart out, Bruce Willis, because this is an incredible, incredible journey. So now, one thing interesting, though, um, John Boy, that happened to you is that, you know, the, it took, as you mentioned, for the IRS to take your Rolls Royce away before you realized the seriousness of it. Let's talk a little bit about that. What happened? Uh, well, are we talking about the health care agency? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, what happened... Uh, Labor Day in 1994, uh, undercover feds, they got into Bel Air, you know, estate behind the gates. And they came in with tow trucks to take away my cars. And, uh, but they didn't take the Rolls Royce because the weekend prior, uh, I, I allow, um, I think it was Universal or Sony Music. Their artist, Angela Wimbush, I allowed her to have her listening party at my home. And they paid me. Mm -hmm. And Ron Isley were married to her. So Ron Isley wanted to drive my Rolls Royce for the weekend. Wow. So I let him drive it for the weekend. So when they came that Monday, the car, that car wasn't there, but all the other, they took all the other cars, but they didn't take the Rolls Royce. So later, Ron said, hey, sell me this car. I said, all right, give me 150000 So he, he bought my second Rolls Royce. Now, John Boy, what was the Rolls Royce worth about that time? Was it worth more than what you uh, sold? I mean, probably 180 Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 
And, and ladies and gentlemen, look at your monitor. You see a picture of it again. And again, you said you're about 32, 33 at this point? 33. 33. Unbelievable. Um, just joining us on the show is Mr. Free Ray Rick Ross. How are you, uh, Rick? <laughs> I'm good. And yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Um, thanks for joining us at the last minute. We really appreciate that. Uh, John Boy, Rick, Rick, John Boy. Rick, what's up, Rick? Hey, what up, John? All right, my brother. I was about to go to sleep when he called me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he well, said, well, said you needed my help. So I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, 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 Rick, um, we're talking about done. we're talking about John Boy's excellent book, Rolling Eighties. This is part two of the seg segment, and the reason why I brought uh, Freeway Rick Ross in is because he was part of the Rolling Eighties. Now, from your and, and and he has an excellent book that I'm also rereading on your monitor. Look at his book right here. Absolute excellent read as well. So, really quick, Rick, what was the Rolling Eighties to you? And what was that time period like? Oh, it was an exciting time, uh, fast moving, wheeling, dealing. Um, I mean, it was just uh, uh, for young for young black men, uh, financial wise was 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 maybe the greatest boom ever for for, for young black men in America. Uh, it was our turn to, to have wealth, mm -hmm. uh, and we had wealth like had never really been seen before by, by black people probably in this country. And it, it was never really meant for black people to make that much money on a drug game. Is that correct? No, they didn't know that, 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 you know, guys like me and John, and, uh, you know, Bo Bennett and little Tommy and, you know, Whitey and so many other guys, they didn't know that, that we would, uh, not use a drug that we would take it and make money with it. Mm -hmm. Which was something totally different uh, for the time, and um, it, they, they made so much money as we were talking about John last week that the gangs made an alliance that they're not going to be killing each other. It's too much money to be made to be trying to kill each other. Is that correct, gentlemen? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, during the during the drug time was the first time that I'd ever seen Crips and Bloods uh, standing on the same street uh, uh, supporting each other. You know, Rick, I'm reading your book, something that's very interesting. I was reading on your book really quickly. I'm not going to take much of your time. Is in grammar school, you were pretty doggone good at marbles as well as tennis. Um, and you always found a way, just like you, just like John Boy, to make turn 10 cents into $20. You all, it seemed <laughs> like you all were numbers guys. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always like numbers. Uh, but I also found out that I had another another skill, and that was to always get what I wanted. <laughs> Explain. Well, you know, I, and I didn't really understand this until I went to prison. Uh, but when I went to prison, I found out that I had planted in my subconscious mind that I should be going to prison. And uh, when I wound up there, I realized that I thought my way into prison. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. John, boy, did you ever... John, did you can, ever... John can contest to this. You can't just walk up to a federal prison, knock on the door, and they let you in. No, 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 no. You, you, you're going to get invited with an indictment. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. now, 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 one thing that's very interesting, uh, and I'm going to let you go after this, though, Rick. John, boy, says something that's very interesting to me, and I really, I'm glad you're on to, um, to uh, elaborate on this, John. You said last week, when I asked you about uh, what was the reason you got into the game, you were saying, I only got into it to be able to pay my bills and to be able to take care of my mom. You didn't get into it to become the biggest in anything. You just came and got into it and got out because you wanted to accomplish a goal. But you were mentioning about Rick, you know, more so he became, he wanted to become the biggest at what he be, at what he was in. Is that correct, Rick? Yeah, I did. Uh, and I got that from tennis, you know, in tennis, you always want to be number one. So uh, I took, I take that with me everywhere I go. You know, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to lose that desire to be, uh, to be number one. You know, uh, I don't want to be number two. I don't want to be three, four, five. I want to be number one. 
Very good. Rick, I'm so apologizing for you, keeping you from taking your nap, but I'll say this, definitely get his book. It is an incredible read as well. And then also um, he's in a cannabis business. He does supply me as well with my CBD rub and all that when I'm in pain from lupus. So where can they be able to uh, purchase <laughs> when they can purchase your product, uh, Rick? Uh, your email will pop up as you mentioned it. Where can they reach out to you so they can get product? Well, they can go to my website, uh, uh, lakingpen.com and freewaycannabis.com. And we'll tell them all the stores that they can get it at. And if they're in California, how to order it right here, wherever you may live. Rick, thank you so much. for, And he's been sending some exceptional bo uh, boxers as guests to be on the Sherrod show. He had Cedric Wyckoff on the um, show. You can check that on Essence Television, as well as Mr. Austin Trout. Rick, thanks so much for taking a moment to be on the Sherrod show. We really Don't appreciate it, sir. Don't forget about Kid Austin, the, <laughs> yes. greatest fighter, the greatest fighter that ever laced up boxing gloves. Don't forget about him. You know, I just signed him about three weeks ago. Also, not fear Charles, my other fighter out of Philadelphia. Uh, uh, Kid Austin is only 18 years old, uh, four and zero already as a professional, and Nafir is uh, 20 years old. He's six and zero. Oh bill. wow, wow. So, well, Rick, I I'm waiting for you to send him up, send him my way, so I can have him featured on the show as well. Okay, we'll do that. Probably after we do the Atlanta, we're gonna be fighting in Atlanta on the third. Uh, both of them will be on the same show. We're gonna go to the Rock Atlanta, and then we'll come holler at you. Thank you so much, Freeway. Enjoy your nap and enjoy the rest of your week, sir. Have a good night, Rick. All right, John. <laughs> All right. So, so, John Boy, now back to you, sir. Uh, we really appreciate Freeway Rick um, giving a moment of his time to be on the Sherrod Show. So now, John Boy, something that was interesting in your book is that um, when you got that indictment and you, got it, um, you had to go to court, um, who was representing you this time? Because last time you had some Jewish brothers that were uh, representing you and you thought you got the raw deal with them. But what happened and who was representing you this time? Uh, I hired a, a, a tax attorney, uh, a Medicare attorney on this one uh, that I thought knew about Medicare by end up teaching them about Medicare. And... Uh, I spent 120,000 and ended up with 10 years when the feds came to me and offered me um, 11 months and I turned it down. So uh, so what did you end up getting, John Boy? Uh, before you answer that, um, <laughs> now, when they don't give you probation for being a first time offender, no, remember, I had the drug case in 88. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a first-time offender. But but if you were a first-time offender, did they give you any special concessions if that was the case, if you didn't have the felony from uh, serving time before? Yeah, yeah, if you were a clear person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now... You know what that means, clear? Yes, yes. Oh, so okay. you mean if you didn't have a record? No, no, if you was white. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got me on that one. Now, so now, John Boyd, this time around, though, when they when the judge handed the sentence down, how many years did you get? A total of 120 months, which is equal to 10 years. Okay, and you have to say it served 85 percent of that being in the federal. Yes, is that correct? I served about eight years and eight months. Okay, now you were mentioning in your book that this time around, it hurt worse than the first time. Why did it hurt the worst this time? Because now I had uh, four daughters versus the one. And, um, I, you know, my mission was to change my life, not to do anything illegal, not to sell drugs anymore. And, uh, and I, I was on the right path. You know, going back to church, you know, looking to settle down, and uh, and then the amount of time. I mean, you know, with the younger, nobody wants to go to jail. But you know, if you go to jail at eighteen and they do two years of one thing, but they go to jail at fifty-eight and do a day, seemed like a year. So right. it just kind of hurt more 
because of all the establishment sale, build my home. I mean, I just had everything set in place and one day, one night. So, um, now, um, the thing that um, is, is really touching about this as well is that um, I felt your pain because one thing that um, I did not mention that is very important to mention is the fact that um, Gene turned state's evidence. Is that correct against you? Yes. Now, um, not against me, against one of my doctors. Okay. He told against one of my doctors, mm -hmm. never against me. Mm -hmm. And they asked me what I want to tell, and they let me go free. And I said, no, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I play dumb. And they said, get him out of here. And then they brought Gene in there. He stayed there hours. And later I found out he, uh, he told on one of my doctors. So that made it easy to trace it right back to you, correct? No. So now, did you uh, communicate with Gene anymore after that? No. E even still to this day? Correct. Wow, wow. And he was so loyal to you um, in so many ways. So now, um, John Boy, you got out. And this time um, when you got out, what was your perspective on life? And did much change this time after serving eight years? Yes, a whole lot changed. You know, the, the computer, the internet, you know, technology taking over, uh, the way people are making money. Uh, a lot of stuff changed. Even Medicare changed. It's not the same uh, for reimbursement, how you can get into business, background check. Uh, so I knew I couldn't go back into that business. But during my time in jail, I've written uh, 42 books and I created 31 business plans, three reality shows, a card game and an animation show. So I utilized them eight years and eight months to really prepare my life, realizing they're gonna be life after prison. What do you do after prison? So I, I went there with the mindset to say, okay, I need to prepare my life for after doing time in prison and that's and that's what i did but one thing you did that, that you didn't mention that was very important as well probably the most important is that you became an ordained minister is that correct oh yes i did you, you, you became an ordained minister and you wrote i think it was 60 books more so than just 45 according to your book it was like 60 books you had written and you were really publishing books that was talking about jesus is that correct yes yes and um uh, one thing that was very interesting, one of the most profound things, and I think you ought to tune into this and we'll take your questions, um, is that one man said something to you that I'll never forget in the book. It was an Oriental man, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he um, said that there was, they told you a story about a man who was, well, you know, I'll let you tell it since it, you the one that uh, put it in your book. Go ahead and tell us the story. Yeah, I met this uh, Asian guy who became kind of tight. We used to walk the lap. And he said, I want to tell you a story, John. I don't want you to get mad. I said, okay. He said that there was a man that went into the jungle. And, you know, he was looking to, you know, kill people and, and use their brain. And uh, he had a white man brain. You know, he killed these people, and then the guy came into a store. So the guy said, how much is for this brain? He said, well, the white man brain is, I think he said, a million dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one million. And he said, what about this one? He said, well, this one, the Asian man brain, and it worth a million dollars. He said, what about this one? He said, this one is a black man brain, and this one is worth $10 million. He said, why so much for the black man brain? He said, because it never been used. Mercy, mercy, boy. Preacher, preach on. Wow. And even though I was writing books, I was doing books, I realized there's so much more that I could be doing with my brain. So I always stay busy, always thinking, creating, never give up. And realize that I rest when I'm dead. Amen. But as long as I'm alive, I'm going to continue to push and move forward 
and, and not even look back. I don't even look at back, oh, I did time in jail. Oh my God, the white man put me in jail. No, I put myself in jail by not doing my due diligence with the people I hired. Amen. I don't blame Amen. nobody. I don't blame anybody. And that's a real man. Um, we're going to take a couple of questions um, and then we're going to close it out. John Boyd's been just more than a gentleman and a scholar being on the Sherrod Show tonight. We really appreciate that. This question is from Vincent. It's from Vincent, who's all the way in New Jersey. He said, um, John Boyd, I picked up a copy of your book. Um, can you, where can I send it so you can autograph it? And his question is, what would you do differently? Or is there anything you would do different from all of the things you've been through? Thanks, Vincent. Uh, yes, I will uh, share my address uh, with uh, Sherrod after the show for you to uh, sing your book and I will autograph it, mail it back to you. And thank you for supporting me. Uh, if I can do anything differently, I would have, one, not sold drugs. Uh, Two, I would have done my due diligence because my Medicare business was one of the most profitable businesses I ever had, uh, ever in my life. I mean, to do a million dollars a month and I net 60 percent of that went to me every month. Uh, I would have done my due diligence and, and, and enhanced that business and franchise. Another mistake I made, and I think we all made mistakes. I'm gonna write a book called Mistakes. The mistakes I made, because we all made mistakes. Amen, amen. But one of the mistakes I, I didn't make, and I would change differently, is that in 1988, one of the biggest drug dealers in Washington, D.C., Rayford Edmund, offered me $2 million to buy my club. In 1988, New Year's Eve, I said no. Four months later, and in May 5th, I was in jail. So I wish I kind of would have sold my club to him. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question, Vincent. Make sure um, the address is on the uh, monitor. You can get send it right to him. He'll gladly autograph. Hey, I got my autograph co copy. It's gonna be worth money, ladies and gentlemen. Don't, don't tell me nothing. Uh -huh. It's gonna be worth some serious money. Our, la our next question is from Lori, from Lori, all the way from New Hampshire. This is East Coast people today, uh, Vincent. Uh, I mean, uh, John Boy, Vincent and Lori. Lori's question is, you speak such a fascinating story. Her question is, did you have a lot of fast women with the fast life you lived? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Lori. Uh, one thing I can say that even though a lot of time money drew a lot of women, I would never a whore. I always had one woman at a time. I wasn't one of those guys that, took advantage of women, use them because I could, never beat them, never hit a woman. Uh, I did with one woman at a time. Wow, wow, I appreciate the question. Well, me want to comment, Lord, I appreciate that. Well, John Boy, um, give us some final words and some advice you would give these young people. When I grew up in Chicago, there's a lot of wannabe drug dealers, but they did not play it smart. Um, and while they were in that life, you know, when they got arrested and everything, they had nothing to show for what they were risking. Give us some advice, some life advice, your final comments. Well, for those that are still thinking about selling drugs in the 21st century, <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. But if you say, forget it, I choose to. I think the first thing they should do is to uh, pick up a law book and find out how much time the amount of drugs that you may get busted with carry. That's the first thing. Because if five rocks carry 10 years and one rock carry probation, you probably want to walk around with one rock. If you ask <laughs> me, are just food for thought know how much time you can be facing if you get busted. Number two, all we have is an attorney that you can call at any given time. Number three, you have to invest that money in some kind of business, not a car, not a watch, not a, you know, a necklace or pendant. Invest your money in some kind of business or some stocks. And you need to create social security and Medicare. 
when you retire, what, what are you going to lean on? You can't, when you sell drugs, you don't pay into Social Security. You don't pay into Medicare. You don't have health insurance, life insurance. A lot of guys that's in the game today, they get killed, man, or go to jail for life. So now you leave a burden on your family to bury you, borrowing money to bury you because there are no life insurance. And a lot of black people don't have life insurance. You're making $10,000 a week and life insurance for a 25 year old kid for $100,000 probably cost you $17. Get some life insurance. Knowing the game that you're in, you have to play the game that you're in if you want to be that way. But I advise anyone, get you 10, 20, 15 friends around the block, put up two, $300, save your money and go into a business together. That's what I would advise anyone to do. John Boy, I want to thank you so much uh, for being on the Shavard Show these last two weeks, sharing your wisdom and your insight. Ladies and gentlemen, even though we talked about the book, that is only half of it. Get the book, ladies and gentlemen, The Rolling 80s. You have to get this book. Uh, you can purchase it directly from me, and you'll be able to get, um, how much is it off, John? $5 off. $5 off with the key code. Just say you saw it on the Sherrard Show. And John Boy will gladly autograph it to you. I'm humbled. I've known him since 2014. He's been a gentleman and a scholar. I really appreciate him being on the Sherrard Show. John Boy, best to you. Um, remember, have me playing the chauffeur in your movie, okay? I'll be the chauffeur. All right. Anything. That's all. That's all. I just For sure. Chauffeur. For sure. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be next. Guests. Thank you. I appreciate it so much, sir. And on our next episode of Sherrard Show, interesting topic. We have Bumps Blackwell's daughter is going to be on the show, Kelly Blackwell. If you don't know who Bumps Blackwell is, he is the one who produced uh, You Send Me by Sam Cooke. The, one of the biggest hits of Sam Cooke. He will be on the show uh, this this next episode. You don't want to miss that. Also, as I mentioned, David Allen Greer and Mr. Uh, Tommy Davidson will be stopping by the Sherrod Show as well. So definitely check it out as well. In the meantime, subscribe to my newsletter and download Essence Television so you can see this episode, part two, um, this week. I'm Sherrod. In the meantime, be safe. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube videos, subscribe to our newsletter at essencetelevisionnetworks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesherrodshow.com. Dot com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.